she uh, just a little girl. She was over practicing, and this is what happens when you keep practicing for years and years. Oh boy, thank you, Reagan. That was wonderful. Gosh, it felt so good. Um, I would love to invite everybody up to up here to join the choir, but not today. Uh, we got a special group here, and so they're going to take up this space in just a moment. But I would like everybody to open up your hymn books, number 815. The, called the doxology, and if you would, let's all stand together and we sing this great song, 815. sisters, come on down.
I tell you what, uh, gosh, I just like to hear new voices all the time. Anytime we can get a, somebody would like to sing. So next Sunday, if there's anybody who's been wanting to be in that choir, and I know there are people out there, uh, I have this riser. <laughs> so I want you to be prepared. When I ask you to come up next Sunday, I want you to come up here, stand on the riser, because as I told the girl this morning, it is different when you stand up here. You're one step off the ground, but it's an amazing feeling that comes over you. And I'm, if you don't believe me, after church, I want you to try it. But <laughs> since we're, we're done with singing, I'd like everybody to find somebody you haven't seen for a while and give them a hug or a handshake. You can give them a hello if you'd like, but let's all do this real quick. Our sorority ladies are going to do one more song before we have our... Yeah. <laughs> saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. I'll tell you the truth. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Amen. This bread 
represents the body of Christ. Remember him as we eat together. This juice represents the blood that Jesus shed for the sins of the world. Remember him as we drink together. Before we take up our offering this morning, I'd like to read from the book of Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Once again, I'd like to read from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. And these are the words of Jesus concerning prayer. Jesus said, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. To tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Well, regarding communion this morning, that's the first time in a long time that we've passed out the communion rather than having people come forward and return to their seats. 
thank you for being here. Well, it really is nice to see uh, all of you this morning. And before we get into our message, I've had a couple of people ask me. I always put a joke of the day in the bulletin. Now, unfortunately, there weren't enough bulletins to go around this morning, and that is a wonderful thing. And that's my fault. I didn't print enough of them. But the joke of the day is, what do elephants have that other animals do not? Of course, little <laughs> elephants. Thank you for ruining that. Who was that? <laughs> um, always you know, someone just spoils the punch while I'm I don't know who that was, but just shame on you. We had someone over here say, I don't get it. <laughs> Once you get inside my head, there's no turning back, baby. Well, you know, given what is happening in the world, especially in Ukraine, I thought it appropriate to read this as a reminder to us all about history, how history is always in jeopardy of repeating itself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was born in 1906, the son of a famous German psychiatrist. Bonhoeffer studied in Berlin and New York City. Bonhoeffer became a pastor, theologian, scholar, teacher. In 1939, he left the safety of America to return to Germany and continue his public denouncing of the Nazis, which led to his arrest in 1943. Bonhoeffer was linked to a group of men and women whose attempted assassination of Hitler failed. While in prison, Bonhoeffer inspired his fellow prisoners by his courage, his unselfishness, and his goodness. He even inspired his guards, some of whom smuggled out of prison his papers and poems. They even apologized to him for having to lock his cell door. While in prison, Bonhoeffer ministered to those who were sick, those who were anxious, those who were depressed. When the Gestapo prison in Berlin was destroyed by an air raid, Bonhoeffer was taken to the concentration camp of Buchenwald. And from there to other places, until he was executed by special order of Himmler at the concentration camp at Flossenburg on April 9, 1945, just a few days before it was liberated by the Allies. The guiding force in Bonhoeffer's life, underlying all that he did, worked, and suffered for, was his faith and love of God, in whom he found peace and happiness. Here's what Bonhoeffer wrote about discipleship. If we answer the call to discipleship, where will it lead us? What decisions will it demand? To answer this question, we shall have to go to Him, for only He knows the answer. Only Jesus Christ, who bids us to follow Him, knows the journey's end. Well, I think everyone here would like to have peace of mind. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to have some peace of mind? But many of us experience more stress in our lives than peace, don't we? So soften the mood just a little bit. Here's a little quiz for you this morning. And as I review the sentence, you can complete the last part of the sentence. So before I start, I never do this, but this morning I don't know why it came to me. You might have to have a couple of little things to help you through this. So here we go with a little quiz. I am just ready to throw in the towel. I am at the end of my I'm just a bundle of nerves. My life is falling apart. And here's the last one. I am at my wits end. Well, we have the right age group, obviously, to complete those sentences. I'm not sure about this side in the second row. <laughs> But if you knew the answer to all of those 
then give yourself an A plus if this was a course at Moorhead State. <laughs> give yourself an A plus or maybe if you're a current student at Moorhead State, maybe you didn't quite get an A plus on those particular questions. But give yourself a C anyway, or a C plus. <laughs> Well, all of us, every single one of us, is under some kind of stress. Think about how many millions of aspirin are consumed in the United States every day. Think of the sales of what I guess some of us still call tranquilizers, so I'm not sure what other words we could use, but think of all the tranquilizers that are sold at record levels. Think of all the books, hundreds of them, if not thousands, that are written to tell us how to find peace of mind but only if you'll buy that particular book from that particular author. Doctors tell us that stress is unhealthy. And I would ask if there's a doctor in the house that can verify that. But our resident doctor, Dr. John Fox, is still in Florida. But he'll be back Tuesday. So, and hello John if you watch us on Facebook. But he'll be back long before this gets put out on Facebook. Well, nearly 3,000 years ago, Solomon wrote, A heart at peace gives life to the body. And that's Proverbs 14.30. The Bible has a lot to say about stress. And it has a lot to say, or even more to say, about peace of mind. But what is peace? The Bible talks about at least three kinds of peace. There's spiritual peace. The spiritual peace is a peace with God, isn't it? So what you think of as spiritual peace? Your peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the foundation. We must have peace with God before we can have any other kind of peace. So that spiritual peace is at the top of the list. And there's only one way to get that kind of peace, that spiritual peace, and that is through, as it tells us, Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is how we find spiritual peace. The next kind of peace is emotional peace. Now I think that is what most of us think about when we think about the word peace. An internal sense of well-being. We are at peace. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, <laughs> Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. God wants to give you that internal peace, that peace of the heart. When everything around you is chaotic, when everything around you is falling apart, you can find that internal peace, that emotional peace, a peace of the heart. Have you ever heard somebody say, I just need to get away from it all. I just need to get away from it. Get away from everything. And I think most of us have said that probably more than once. Have you ever been so tired at night that all you can do is make it to the bed and collapse? You're so tired from the day, you make it to the bed, and you just collapse. But when you lay down, your mind is still racing sometimes, isn't it? Your mind is still going from one thought to the other. So we could, quote, get away from it all. We could go on a wonderful trip to the beach and see John Fox and his family. <laughs> or we could go camping in the mountains. We could go hiking. There are all kinds of places that we can go and get away from it. But if we don't have emotional peace, our minds are going to continue to race, aren't they? On and on. Even when we're lounging on the beach. We might be physically comfortable laying on that nice warm sand, soaking up the sun, 
have enough soda, glass of lemonade, cold water. But our mind is still where it was. We tried to get away from it, but it's still there. So if we don't have that emotional peace, whether we're on the beach or high on the mountaintop, we're not going to get away from it. Matter of fact, we can't get away from ourselves, can we? Can we ever take a vacation from ourselves? We can't become someone or something else, can we? So we need to have spiritual peace, the peace with God, and then the emotional peace, the peace of the heart. And then the third kind of peace the Bible says we need is relational peace. Now what is that? Relations. <clears throat> peace with other people. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. All of us know from experience that relationships can be a source of stress. <clears throat> Even the best of relationships have some kind of stress, don't they? For many of us, our biggest problem or problems are people problems, aren't they? When we think about it, you know, getting along with our boss, getting along with our co-workers, getting along with our family, our relatives, getting along with our neighbors. And I know this is going to sound a little bit crazy, but even getting along with our church family. So, <laughs> now no one chuckled at that. I said it sounded crazy. I was hoping we might have a chuckle or two. But seriously, we deal with conflict. We deal with competition. We deal with criticism on a regular basis, don't we? Hmm. All of those things, all of those issues rob us of peace. We all need spiritual, emotional, and relational peace in our lives. But can we really find it? And the answer to that last question is yes. In John 14, 27, Jesus promised us something. And Jesus never breaks a promise. Not to my knowledge. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Jesus promised that He leaves us with peace, His kind of peace. And He spoke those words right before He went to the cross. Jesus says that His peace is a gift. It's a gift to the world. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. We can't try to get it. It is a gift. We simply accept that gift. Jesus says that His peace is different from the peace that the world gives. The peace of the world is a fragile thing, isn't it? That peace is something that can be broken at any moment. Someone has figured out that during the last 3,500 years, the world has had just 286 years of peace. Now, I don't know who calculated that. I forget where I even came across that. So you'll have to look that up on your own. But as we think about our knowledge of history, how many periods of time in this world has there been peace? The peace of this world is a fleeting thing. It's a temporary thing. It can change in an instant. It was peaceful, relatively speaking, in Ukraine until a few days ago, until a madman decided that the country should be his. They had peace. 
But look what's happened. So they have to seek and know that they have the other kind of peace. They have the spiritual peace. They have the emotional peace. They have the relational peace that comes through the peace of Christ. In a world that is filled with violence, filled with fear, filled with war, how can we possibly find some peace? So let's close with these verses. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And once again, John 14, 27. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. We're going to have an invitation hymn this morning. And if you haven't found that kind of peace, the only peace that you're really going to have today is an opportunity. Don't pass today by. This may be the only opportunity that you have to have that peace that Jesus offered come into your hearts and a peace that you can share with the world. Our invitation to him this morning is number 479. It's called Softly and Tenderly, and let's all stand together. <clears throat> Three verses. I can. 